All right, we have a question here from JJJ Junior S. And uh, essentially, um, he agrees with my assessment of histogen, which basically I was um, unimpressed with their photography that they, they submitted at the Bahamas meeting in Nassau this year. Uh, their numbers are very impressive, but numbers are just numbers, and, and you know, uh, photographs do the talking. You know, if the before and afters aren't impressive, then you have to ask yourself, well, what's going on here? And uh, when I looked at the before and afters, um, honestly, the photos uh, did not have the same lighting. The before and afters had different lighting. And uh, when you see something like that, you, you have to you have to ask the question, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you make sure you had similar lighting in the before and afters? And the representative for the company honestly couldn't, couldn't explain that. And uh, then she also stated that what, um, what they're doing is inducing improvement in the diameter of existing hair. Well, that's what we anticipate from these pro-inflammatory products. That, that we're not going to create new hair, we're going to improve the quality of existing hair. Well, she did went on to say, we're not creating new hair. And then she said that she had actually seen histogen stimulate hair growth in a, in a scar. Well, scars don't have existing hair. They have no hair. It's just scar tissue. Uh, to which, you know, if... And histogen is producing growth in scars, and that's very impressive because it means that you're getting de novo hair. But again, she said, we're not creating new hair. So I asked her again, and, and of course at that point, uh, she became angry <laughs> and uh, uh, wanted to know why I was arguing with her, which I wasn't. I'm, you know, I was just pointing out a fact that uh, she said they weren't creating new hair, but now apparently... Uh, they are. So at any rate, I think there are a lot of questions here with histogen, and of course she didn't show any photographs of this hair growing in the scar. There are a lot of questions, um, and we need to, you know, uh, we can't get too excited yet, because while the numbers are impressive, the before and after photographs certainly are not. Um, and then there's another question uh, about donor regeneration with A-cell, and you know, of 60%. We've seen uh, yields of 60% and it's slightly better. And um, uh, JJ wants, says it's a bold statement to make without any evidence. And can you quantify the donor regeneration? Uh, then you must have performed some type of analysis, such as hair counts, to end up with that number. If that's the case, then I think uh, you should share that analysis. And I'm sure I will. Um, what I started to do was on every patient, I have a, 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 a grid, a donor template that I apply to the donor area. And then when I take hair out of the donor area, I note how many follicular units I took out of each region. So that allow me to know how many follicular units were in that region preoperatively, how many follicular units I removed from that region, and what percentage of follicular units I removed from that region. And then I can track that over a span of time. So what I did was, I, in my first study, I took a patient and I looked at the left-hand side of his scalp, and I, I made my grids with my donor template, which is going to be the same every time I put it on the patient. And uh, I took graphs out. And I, I made a note of how many grafts I took out of each region. Well, then the patient came back, and at that point we, we took a, uh, what I call my uh, counting incision device. And instead of putting a, um, something in it to cut skin to make recipient sites, I put a, a small felt tip ink uh, tip out of uh, one of my surgical markers. And so every time... I saw a, an extraction site, I, I put a little purple mark in it. And I did this for every extraction site that I saw on, in each region. 
And then what I did was I took the uh, counting device and I looked at the total number for each region and I wrote it down. And then I went to the next region and I made a little dot everywhere I saw an extraction site and <clears throat> wrote that number down. So I did this for, for uh, um, uh, six, six, seven different regions and uh, then I compared it to the preoperative number of extraction sites. And what I found was that the total number of extractions was much greater than the total number of extraction sites. So, in other words, we had hair that was growing in extraction sites uh, that had been made preoperatively. And in that particular case, it was, I believe, around 53% follicle regeneration. Now I've done other cases where um, again we use the same grid, uh, we note the number of extraction sites, we bring the patient back, we shave the donor area, and then we take the counting device and put a purple dot everywhere we see an extraction site and we tabulate the entire number and we compare the preoperative number of extractions to the number of extraction sites that we see. These are empty sites in the donor area, which if you take out an intact follicular unit, you're going to have a gap where the follicular unit used to be. And we compare the preoperative with a postoperative number, and we look at the percentage. Now, I've had cases that where the yield was uh, less than uh, 50%. I've had cases where the, the, the regeneration was around 20%. So the question is, why are some, is some of the time is the, the yield much better than it is other times? And the answer is, we don't know. Um, what I am assuming is that postoperatively, the patients have a, a little bit of oozing out of the extraction sites, and a lot of times the extracellular matrix, the A cell that we put in the extraction sites, uh, oozes out. Now, why would I get follicle regeneration from my extraction sites and let's say something like the, uh, the robot, the artist robot, why wouldn't it get regeneration? And the answer is simple. Um, with my extraction sites, I make a minimal depth incision, meaning I, I don't want to go any deeper into the skin than I have to. If I, if I can do it under two millimeters deep, then I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that. And then I ease or tease the follicles out of that extraction site. And because I ease them out, I'm not taking a block of adipose around that graft. I'm just taking out the individual follicles. And by taking out the individual follicles and leaving all the surrounding tissue behind, I'm leaving the whatever stem cells were on those follicles in the donor area. And what that means is that when I put the A-cell back into that extraction site, then that has the opportunity to react with those stem cells that were originally from hair and induce them to produce new hair follicles. So that's why I get follicle regeneration. Why wouldn't the robot get follicle regeneration? Because they make an incision four millimeters deep. And they pride themselves on big, plump, thick grass, meaning they, they make an incision all the way down, take out all the adipose, all the surrounding tissue, take, just take it out in a big block and transfer it. And that's, that's a real common belief among strip surgeons in general is that you need all that adipose around the follicles to produce hair. Well, let me just tell you uh, quickly that you don't need adipose or fat to generate hair. You need hair follicles to generate hair. What you're getting with these, these uh, deep incisions, such as with strips and, and, and people that believe you need to make deep cuts with FUE, is you're getting all this adipose out. You're, doing, you're not just doing a hair transplant, you're doing a fat transplant. So you're adding a lot of extra unnecessary volume to the recipient area, and that's one of the reasons why you, you'll see individuals that even with follicular unit transplant surgery done in the hands of good surgeons who do strips, a lot of times you'll see what we call ridging, 
and that's a speed bump on the scalp. And basically, if you take your hand, you rub it up there, all of a sudden you come to this lump and up over it. And that's because you've added all this adipose, you've added all these, these hair follicles, and you've added it into an area where there's no place for this extra volume to go except up. It can't go down because you've got rock hard bone. It has to go up. So the skin elevates and you get this ridging or speed bump. Well, if all you do is transfer hair follicles, which is all you need to do a hair transplant, you're not going to get ridging because you don't have all that extra unnecessary volume. Well, at any rate, because I do minimal depth FUE, I leave stem cells behind and I get follicle regeneration. Now, I know there are other physicians that, because of my, my work, have, um, have tried it, but they're doing full thickness um, extractions, and, and again, they're removing all the stem cells. But then you have other physicians um, uh, that have acknowledged that we, we are getting successful regeneration. And I'm, so I'm not the only one. And so... Uh, um, you know, just stay tuned. You know, I, I, my personal belief is that you know it's 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 dis, difficult to 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 uh, accept that we're getting follicle regeneration. It's even difficult for me to accept it because uh, you know it's it's it seems too good to be true. But in fact, we are. Now, the real key is, can we? Can, how can we get a higher percentage? And, and one of the ways that, that uh, has been suggested to me is to coat the donor area with a product that seals the A cell in place so that it doesn't ooze out. And we've begun to do some of that. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll keep you posted on what those results are. Now, how do I deliver the A cell? I mix it in a viscous product that is non-bonded and is reabsorbed. Uh, within a matter of days, which releases the um, A cell into the extraction sites. I then like to apply uh, A cell over the top of that and then seal it in place. And we're looking at another product to, to actually induce uh, absorption of the A cell into the extraction sites that may improve our yields uh, better and also take the A cell into solution, which currently is a particle. Uh, so that's that's where we stand with A-cell, and uh, it's very exciting, it's very interesting, um, and we'll keep looking at it. But uh, one thing I can tell you is that in, in patients where I've used A-cell, and I have uh, well over uh, 2,500 grafts extracted in uh, the, first the first pass, when I go back to do a second pass and take more grafts, it's amazing to me how much more hair there is in the donor area because an average donor area has typically somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 follicular units that can be transferred from the donor area to the recipient area without making the donor area appear too thin. And that, is, that number is the same across the board. It doesn't matter whether it's strip surgery or FUE, the same number of flicker units can be moved. Now, that's not to say we can't move more. We can, but the donor area might begin to appear a little thin. And, you know, we can move in some individuals over 9,000 flicker units and in, in rare individuals over 10,000 flicker units. But that's not your everyday patient. What I'm seeing with the application of A-cell is that my second pass where I expect the donor area to be a little thinner has a lot more hair than I would have anticipated. So for me, it's a, it's a, a very exciting product, and so stay tuned.